Hey guys, you know when I always say I'm going to leave a video for a part 2 and then never actually make a part 2 on it? Yep, not even Pepperidge Farm remembers because it never happens. Usually I get bored of a topic and my desire to move on to something new is too overpowering. So today I figured we should finish that abiogenesis video that we got halfway through. Alright, let's do this. This last one is a doozy. When a long chain of RNA is suspended in cool water with high concentrations of free nucleotides, the chain can act as a template for its own replication. Nucleotides automatically base pair with their partners on the existing chain. If their backbone atoms form chemical bonds with each other, and by the way, this is the part that currently requires assistance from researchers, we're not yet sure how this would have happened in the wild, a complementary RNA strand is born, one with the exact inverse sequence of the original. If the water is then heated, Paired bases lose their grip, allowing both chains to act as templates when the cycle repeats. So just to add my own point, this is actually a relatively basic but fundamental concept on how we're able to amplify genetic information in the laboratory. Usually if we need to look at DNA or certain genes in a tissue sample, for example, we can use this method, although not exactly the same, to mass replicate genetic information. You may have heard of this already, it's polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. If you haven't heard of it before, you've probably heard of it as a test to diagnose for COVID, the PCR test. But in reality, PCR can be used for a variety of different things. Basically, whenever you need to create more DNA, either to see it better or for whatever other purpose, you can do it, and it's relatively simple. With today's machines, the process is largely hands-off. The concept is pretty simple as well. We use RNA primers to indicate exactly which gene we want to target, add it to the mix along with some other preparations such as nucleotides, then have it go through a cycle of heating and cooling. The heat cycle allows it to have an optimal temperature for unzipping, elongation, and ultimately replication. And heat by itself is powerful enough to allow this process to happen, hence what was said in the video. Obviously in nature, we won't have the temperature controlled exactly like it is in a lab, but any fluctuation in temperatures would actually promote this, even if it's not 100 percent efficient. The only thing wrong with this claim is pretty much everything about it contradicts well-established science. Here's just five reasons why. It starts with this beautiful RNA molecule that needs to be duplicated. This can't happen prebiotically. Notice that the template RNA is unfolded. RNA like this has no function. If it remains unfolded, it can't do anything and will never be selected for because replicating it doesn't grant any benefit because it doesn't do anything. But if it was folded, it couldn't be duplicated. And the colder the water is, the more likely that it'd be folded up on itself as well. Yes, RNA has to be folded in order to have any function. Just like proteins, ribozymes are folded into shapes with a hairpin or hammerhead active site to interact with things. However, you literally just said the colder the temperature, the more likely for it to be folded in on itself, and that's really where the point of the temperature comes in. Heat tends to unwind things, and RNA is no exception. During periods of warming and cooling, these pre-life RNA strands can also be folded and unfolded to expose its primary structures. Now, in our bodies, we usually have enzymes to help us do that and accelerate these processes in less favorable conditions, but can happen without them as well. That's why enzymes are catalysts after all. So during cooler times we may see more ribozymes serving their functions, but spontaneously under even slightly higher temperatures we may see more replication, and that is hence the point. RNA doesn't have to stay in one form or another, but rather it can be dynamically changing depending on the environment, which temperature plays a major role in. This handsome RNA also isn't bonded with anything else. Unlikely, especially considering that it could bond with itself and the overwhelming amounts of garbage floating around in nature. It does bind with itself. Even RNA today binds with itself. And sometimes when this happens, important secondary structures are realized such as riboswitches. They can even bind to other RNA molecules to make even more complex tertiary structures. But just because this process can happen doesn't mean it can't be unwinded. Sure, sometimes binding with itself will lower its ability to replicate. But again, that's where the unwinding occurs. If he can unwind an RNA binding to its complementary strand, why couldn't it also unbind it from itself? It's literally the same process other interfering molecules and ions getting in the way. But water would also prevent the bonds we want, because hydrogen bonds between a nucleotide and the water itself are stronger than they are between individual nucleotides. In other words, these molecules are not single and ready to mingle. They've already got a honey. In that case, why don't you explain why RNA doesn't just bind to water within living organisms today and that stops it from replicating or binding to complementary strands? By your logic, primers shouldn't exist. Double-stranded RNA shouldn't exist. Retroviruses shouldn't exist. If water truly has a higher affinity than a complementary nucleotide, that would not only mess up RNA but also DNA because a water molecule would just simply replace the complementary nucleotide at any part of the DNA, therefore breaking it down. You can't get away from water. It's literally in every cell and every living thing and is a 
solvent for everything you can imagine in life. Now, I don't even have to spell out the answer for you, it's simply because the affinity of a complementary nucleotide is greater. Of course, that doesn't mean single-stranded RNA can't bind to water, it absolutely can, and in many cases, RNA requires water to stabilize its structure, but to think that it would bind to nothing but water is just ridiculous, considering that it would rather bind to another nucleotide due to affinity. They also show free nucleotides in high concentration floating in water. Where do you even get high concentrations of free nucleotides on a prebiotic Earth? The same place you'd find high concentrations of free $100 bills. Only in your dreams. Actually, everywhere. If you already have properly structured RNA, which in case we do because we're talking about RNA replication here, then obviously you would have free-floating nucleotides. Nucleotides have to bind together to form these strands, obviously, which in the original video it was mentioned that this is still under scientific investigation, but whatever the mechanism, it obviously is not holding all nucleotides together. Most would definitely not be binded and are therefore free-floating in the surrounding environment. It's not degraded. Again, unlikely considering that its lifespan is similar to that of cottage cheese, especially since the water it'd be floating in would degrade the RNA and the individual nucleotides. This is why in laboratory synthesis, storage, and use of DNA monomers actually occurs in the absence of water. How? Genuine question. How in the world do you store or use DNA without water? It's literally impossible. We store DNA under cold temperatures, dissolved in water. Of course, water does indeed play a role in degrading genetic material, hence the reason we need to store such samples under cold temperatures in the first place. By the way, we're talking about hydrolysis as applied to the chains directly rather than the hydrogen bonds at the tip of nucleotides, in case anyone is confused, which are two separate topics. RNA is technically more susceptible to being broken down by hydrolysis than DNA is, but can actually be pretty stable under the right conditions. Actually, a larger reason why RNA is broken down is due to changes in pH, which means using the correct buffer would increase the stability of RNA, hence why we have buffers helping in RNA storage in the laboratory. Buffers are literally everywhere, even in pre-life Earth, and even if they didn't exist, that doesn't mean RNA is instantly broken down either, and fluctuations in environmental conditions such as temperature can allow it to transition between various forms, where it can go through phases of being intact and phases of being broken down. So you're technically not wrong, but you're overestimating the effects of water by itself. And that brings me to another point in which creationists just don't understand. Here in the original video, he's just giving us the idea that water breaks down DNA monomers and then just throws his hands up in the air and goes like, oh, that just disproves everything. That's not how to think scientifically. Rather, when an obstacle comes up, you have to think of potentially other ways that could potentially circumnavigate this problem. If someone was murdered in a locked room that can only be locked from the inside, a detective isn't just going to go like, well, the room is locked. No one could have possibly killed this person. Of course not. But rather, you have to think of other possibilities and other methods that murderer could have used, such as the window, for example. Similarly, for RNA to exist in pre-life Earth, you have to think, okay, sure, water can break down RNA, but what other potential conditions could have existed that allowed RNA to be more stable? Can it thrive even in the presence of water? Perhaps even if it's broken, it can be built back together? Instead, you would rather just throw your hands up while scientists would take that extra step further, and that's where our thinking processes ultimately differ. I don't claim to know all the answers, nor do scientists that work on abiogenesis, but we at least know to go beyond just, oh, this one mechanism makes it impossible, therefore the entire idea should be thrown out. Anyway, I didn't get to finish the rest of the video today, so part 3 is still on the table. Though I'm getting a bit tired of this, so we'll see. Thank you to Fireshard, Alan Morton, Miss Fixit, and Rick Clen for their support over on Patreon, and I'll see you in the next one.